Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing what it takes to get goods to where they will do the most good, to understand communities, many of whom are recovering from disaster as a crisis, with our special guest, Romaine Seguin of Good360. So, Romaine, it's great to see you. It's great to have you on. I'm so excited to be talking about getting good goods to good places where they can do the most good right yeah it's it's a you know it's a fabulous uh organization we turned 40 years old november one and a lot of people don't know us um but we are a product philanthropist we get goods where they are in the greatest need to open opportunity for all i mean that's that's really what it comes down to and we have an incredible portfolio of donors Um, some world-class organizations that either want to get inventory out of their, uh, out of their system, returns, um, obsolete inventory. There's a numerous reasons. They want to shut down a DC, numerous reasons why the product's there. And they wanted to do it good, the product to do good for them and for communities. Um, so that's why it's really exciting because there is so much product out there and there's so much need. So it's a perfect uh, fit for us to work with the donors. Well, I love the connection between doing well and doing good, right? Mm-hmm. This whole idea that that those are at odds is to me anathema. The, the, the genius of the American system is the combination and the interaction between business and civil society, between nonprofit organizations and business, between uh, government and private citizens, right? This whole idea is that there's there's not one particular uh, correct way of being, but that it's a negotiation where people rub against each other and sort of figure it out. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the journey of the organization. Talk a little bit about how it was founded. Okay. And then the genesis over the last couple of years. And I'd like to take a look at what's happened recently, but let's go back into the past a little bit because it might be instructive for how we should respond today to our current situation and the problems that that the future is bringing us. Yeah. So a very important law was created uh, in 1980. It is called a 170 CE that allowed organizations to take fair market value of donated goods, as long as it it took care of the ill, the needy, and infants. Those so that good. meant that if 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 my fair market value of this cup of coffee, right, which has black coffee in it, so it's the coffee in the mug. Five dollars. Fair mar- market value is five dollars or twenty dollars or whatever it is, right? I can actually claim that I've donated five dollars yes. or twenty dollars because had I sold it, that's what I would get, and I have no incentive to overproduce right it doesn't it doesn't actually um shift our markets it just provides access to this product to people who otherwise might not be able to afford it right absolutely so that happened in in the late 1980 3m donated copiers and fax they just they literally strategically put them in front of the United Way Worldwide Corporation, which is four blocks from us in Old Town, Alexandria. That happened and they didn't know what to do with it. They had an executive, Susan Corgan, and she is the founder and the first CEO for Good360, spun it off, got an incredible board and formed November 1. It was incorporated in March of 84, but they actually started donating goods November 1. So this is Goodwill? No. Good, good. No, no. It's called Gifts in Kind International. That's what they named it. But the product was absolutely dumped. The, the, the product was placed in front of United Way's office. United Way, they, okay. Yeah, United Way. And they had to figure out, okay, what do we do with it? So they, they, it didn't match up with their mission because it was product. Right. So they, they placed all those fax machines and copiers throughout United Way's system, and they work with strategic partners to get transportation, um, in-kind donation of transportation to get it to nonprofit. Well, then then products started becoming available. In the last five years with the whole ESG initiative movement, 
it is just, and there's so much product. I mean, for a lot of reasons, e-commerce boom, the COVID situation, a lot of product is still out in the market. That Well, I've been in half of my career has been in manufacturing, uh-huh. right? A discrete uh, um, um, process manufacturing. Um, uh, a part of my career has been in logistics, right? Um, uh, 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 transportation, intermodal, and so on and so forth. And then uh, a big part of my career has been in software. Now, if you take a look at the, the normal business cycles, there are times when you have product that needs to be disposed of, right? It's not intentional. You you plan out a production run and then whatever, COVID hits or recession yeah. happens or whatever it is, you're left with product. What do you do with the product? So and that's, that's, this that's is the solution, where, right? That's that's where we come in and, and work with our donors on what's their values, what's their mission, you know, some organizations that we work with want want to serve children. Some want to serve poverty areas. Um, so it's great that we're able to do it. So what we do is vet out. We have about 100,000 nonprofits in our network. So we ensure the compliance of the nonprofits. 501c3, they have a board, they have a physical address, they have a mission statement. And we make sure that they have the ability to facilitate product in their communities. So, you know, once in a while, you might have someone that that you have a bad actor or actress out there with product that uh, shouldn't be on the internet or shouldn't be anywhere else. So that's- What do you do with that? Let's say I made made a product and it's hazardous, right? And then you accept it and then you find out that it's hazardous. Um, There's a choking hazard for kids or whatever. What yeah. do you do with that? What, what we do with it is we recycle that. You know, we don't want it to go anywhere. So we strip the product down and make sure it doesn't go, it gets passed on to a nonprofit because that would be a challenge for them. And there's very little product in there because we, we work with our donors up front and they know exactly. We do, we do not take food. Um, you know, we'll take shelf, like nutritious bars, water, and all that kind of stuff for disasters. But we do not take food per se. So we're, we're out of that space. But there are once in a while that we get product that's not deemed for the nonprofits, uh, whether it's, it's not safe or whether it's inappropriate, one of the two. Right. So so uh, in that particular uh, case, um, you're also uh, your leverage is that uh, people start to take a reputational hit if they if they do this. Right. They get a mm-hmm. reputation for trying to exploit um, a, a loophole mm-hmm. and they do it once, but the second time is not going to be no. uh, print, right. No. Yeah. And so you've got kind of a self-policing situation. One of the things that strikes me is that you don't take fresh, you do take food, but you don't take fresh. Is that correct? Right. Correct. I mean, that's, that's just, we, we don't have the ability to do that. So if you take a look at food banks, food banks are, is your model because food banks basically yes. are, are collaborating in the same basis that you do with producers of product, but their product is is producers of food. So these are growers and so on who are supplying because they might have an oversupply of strawberries or carrots or whatever it happens to be. And now people can have access to that at a lower price without harming the business model of, of, of the growers. So overproduction, which will happen in some crop or another in the course of a year, ends up still accruing to the benefit of society. So, so these kinds of models are are, are really uh, well explored. And how have you scaled over the years? So, from 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 photocopiers, which are which are big clunky products, right? Now you've diversified, and you're doing everything from cereal bars to uh, to toys to all these different products. So, talk a little bit about how you've scaled and the diversity of different products that you supply. Yeah. So it's really the power of our network um, that we're we're able to move around the United States. And we do move some product overseas, and I can elaborate on that a bit. But predominantly, it's in the United States. And we have an incredible network set up to feed our nonprofits with product, not food, with product. And our our diversification has just come from our different donors. Um, You know, Amazon's one of our large donors, Walmart. Bombas, Advance Auto Parts. I mean, you have some really unique donors. Advance Auto Parts, 
we have a, a, a match set up with them where we're in, we go to schools, nonprofit schools that teach folks to be mechanics and they donate the product for that, for that school. And um, I love it. It's very interesting. I, the, the one story I was at, I was at a advanced auto parts um, management conference and they told a story that there was an autistic uh, young man who was training to be a mechanic well, his mom would go there every day. She loved that so much. She got into the program and is now a mechanic. So they're both mechanics. I thought, my God, that's so heartfelt, Mom. And I just, um, so that's that's very unique in itself. We're a partner with Toys for Tots. Toys for Tots came to us when the pandemic and like, we got to get books. We got to get toys out to these folks. So now they have a year round program and we are their logistic arms of getting it to the nonprofits. Well, you see the, these partnerships with, for example, First Book. Um, you see it with with all these different organizations. And from a business point of view, you're also uh, providing a, a risk mitigation service mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that Amazon can be so conveniently stocked to supply basically us all, the world, in part because there is a risk mitigation strategy if they are overstocked. Mm-hmm. And then get that those products out to some social good rather than destroy the products, because that would be the other and that would just create uh, waste issues. Right. So in terms of the skills that you require in order to um, exercise your business model, talk a little bit about how your teams are formed and the different types of, of competencies that you have to have embedded within your organization. How do you shape that? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. It's it's a lot of logistics background. We hire folks who have been in the warehousing, who have been in fulfillment. We just hired a, a new person up uh, in Omaha. That's where we have our fulfillment center for our e-commerce platform. She had worked at Amazon for a year. I mean, you know, in the warehouse, knowing how to move product in and out. And, you know, you can teach people that, don't get me wrong, but boy, does it make a big difference if you can bring someone on and hit the ground running from knowing inbound, outbound, you know, what what efficiencies, you know, although we're nonprofit, we got to be very, very efficient. You know, we got to lead ESG initiatives with mal reduction with, you know, can we are in our LTL movements? Can we maximize that truckload? I mean, we have to do our part to be part of that sustainable effort with our donors. And I suspect a lot of your costs are associated with uh, logistics, transportation, warehouse logistics, and, and so on, and the competencies as well, staff competencies that attach to that logistics uh, flow uh, is probably absorbing quite a bit. When you accept a donation, let's say I'm Amazon and I'm, I'm giving you a ton of Amazon products. Do you require Amazon to help in the tra- in funding the transportation logistics either through in-kind donations of transportation services or in a in a cash contribution when you accept the the uh, the product? How does that work? We got we got both models, Mark. So okay. some donors will pay the transportation. Others will say we'll get it to you then it's down to you. Others will say you got to come pick it up. Um so it, it's very interesting so what, how, do, how are we sustainable in that model? We do charge a small admin fee to pick pack and to get it to our nonprofit if it's, if it's a smaller nonprofit or if it's a, a, a pallet or if it's a whole truckload. And typically the amplification is for every dollar our nonprofit spends, they get $50 worth of product. That's, that's really, that's terrific. So it's a one to 15. Yeah, amplification. That's that's really amazing. And and so what you're also doing is you've got a pricing model, right? When I used to be uh, working in logistics in the um, I, I, I was I was involved with uh, with uh, um, uh, sea, land, uh, uh, river and uh, rail. Right. So all those different different uh, logistics chains required somebody who understood and it internalized the cost so well that with the assistance of computers, but also with their gut feel, they could price the uh, the entire chain kind of, kind of instantaneously. Do you have those right. kinds of people as well who really? Yeah, have we a, do. A, it's, it's, it's a, yeah the the 
full truckload movements and the LTL is pretty simple because you get you know what the rates right. are in the market and typically there's technology out there. It's that the partial. Is it's the yellow freight, right? It's it's, yeah. it's those uh, those partial uh, loads that, that yeah. get complicated, right? Yeah. So, but our e-commerce platform, that's where all that math and magic comes in at. So, yeah, we do have experts at that. We, we call it administration fees, um, okay. not pricing. It, it, they're just they're fees for us to be able to facilitate the product to the nonprofit. And, uh, you know, but we do have some very strong donors that that will pay for that shipping. And it's wonderful. Um, nonprofits love that. <laughs> That's terrific. And and in terms of your board and advisory groups and so on and so forth, do you have people who can um, who have ties into this network of businesses that can provide you with uh, early um, insight into how these businesses are are evolving and shaped and and bring ideas that allow you to retain that very close connection? both to the supplier side and also the consumer side, the nonprofit partners who are actually uh, taking on these products. Yeah, we. I, I will tell you, Mark, we have a fabulous board. Um, they have a very, you know, they're, they're very engaged, which that, that that's the number one thing you want. Diverse skill sets, diverse, yeah, diverse di- perspectives. Different skill sets. We, we do have uh, someone from UPS on the board. We have someone who was once part of Feed in America, but uh, termed out of his uh, 12 years. He's been with us for 12 years. So, I mean, they're really unique skill sets that fit us as a nonprofit. Um, we have another person on that who ran the logistics of the USPS uh, Postal Service. So, I mean, you know, we match, we try to match up with what we need. We have someone who owns their own marketing company, Co Collective in New York, that's just fabulous that, you know, ha- got us to where we are on, you know, there's enough goods to go around and open opportunity for all. And it's just been a- wonderful. I can't say enough about the board. I mean, you know, a lot of individuals aren't as fortunate, as blessed as I am, but we have a fabulous board. And you have people who also are geographically dispersed throughout the United States who yes. understand the regional uh, aspects and the urban versus rural kind of yes. uh, connections yes. in, inside the country as opposed to the coastal cities. You have all that. Yes, yeah, we do. There, it's it's diverse from you know geographic and and their expertise skills. So intentional. It's it, it, that that's wonderful. By the way. Um, one of the things that, that I noticed you you were the you. Uh, you, UPS president of, of Global Freight Forwarding in an earlier year of your career? I uh, I worked for UPS for 38 years. Um, so I was your customer in Germany, uh, actually not in Germany, in, in the EMEA region. I was re, I, I was helping uh, the head of the EMEA, EMEA region of Ingersoll Rand to reshape global logistics. And we shut down warehouses all throughout certain areas. I think there were 30 warehouses we consolidated in partnership with uh, UPS, uh, the global, I think it was your, your operating unit. And this was, this was, uh, way, way early. I don't know whether you had that job at that well, point. I was, I was in Europe two different times. Um, oh. so I moved nine times with UPS. My first move was to Europe. Uh, we had 12 acquisitions. I moved to London in 89 when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. Uh, so we, back then I was very young in my career, but they said, can you help us set up the network? And I loved it. I, it was a wonderful opportunity, personally and professionally. I lived in London, got moved to Paris, then went back to the States, and then went back um, in 2007. So it was like a big... We, 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 we were crossing each other um, transatlantically. Do you find that that the experience here in the nonprofit world is substantially different? Are there, are there aspects that... Uh, you find to be uh, really disconnected from your previous life. And, and I'm sure that there are other areas, we've already yeah. discussed some of them, where where there is a, a real coincidence of skill and yeah. expertise that's required. It, that's a question I get asked often. You know, tell me about when you worked at UPS and now at a nonprofit. UPS was very process-driven. I mean, you know, I, I drove my, my first job. I was a driver. I had 1.2 seconds to buckle my belt and turn the thing. Everything was measured from the minute you clocked in to the minute you clocked out. Industrial engineering, that's that's how you run an efficient operation. Right. So 
I thought when I came here, nonprofits don't have the resources to have everything documented. And it's just not us. It's and, and it's just not our type of nonprofit. It's also it's more anything. bespoke, right? It's yeah. more customized. Everything yeah. is more suited to the person or the organization or the need, right? Yeah. So it's that kind of, you know, I, I've i sat on many boards, but I didn't get into the weeds of how the organization was ran. So if I were to say anything nonprofits could really utilize is written documented process that if someone wins a lottery tomorrow and finance and accounting or in e-commerce here's your playbook um you know you, you still will struggle but nothing like you know like where, where do we go so that was a big surprise to me the second surprise because we have all kind of nonprofits in our network i assumed all nonprofits loved each other <laughs> and there was no politics, right? And everybody had hold the hell down. I just, I just thought every, you know, whether it was Salvation Army, whether it was, you know, Boys and Girls Club, they all loved each other. Well, that's not the case some some of the time. So but we're all people, right? And and also the uh, part of the nonprofit, and this is the genius of the uh, of the um American um approach to um, incorporated entities, whether it's a nonprofit or a business uh, entity, there's a lot of competition. There there's is. competition for there resources, is. there's a competition for brand awareness, and basically it allows people to both succeed and fail, right? You succeed based in, in competition, you generally fail based in competition as well, and you mm -hmm. have to stay sharp. And I think that's that's part of it, right? And the emotional yeah, is. side Absolutely. is, is, is it's they're competing not, for right? our funds. You name it; they're competing for funding. They're competing for uh, resources. Um, they're competing for brand awareness. Competing for you know politicians, whatever it may be. They're all competing to be that one voice to get to, to get their organization taken care of, whether it's funding or, or human, uh, you know, people. Yeah, the premise of this of this whole show, this endeavor, is is to look at different models. That there's not just one solution. The premise of our of our executive search business is that is that competency counts, and mm -hmm. the return on investment might be in terms of social impact and, and advantaging people. It might not be in profit at the end of every quarter, but the actual competencies are uh, th that deliver that return, whether it's in profit in business. Or, or impact on the nonprofit, the return on that is so important and process uh, management accountability is really, really key. How do you hold people accountable within the nonprofit uh, constraints that, uh, in which you operate as opposed to the business constraints where you can actually, you know, pay more money because you're making more profit, right? You, you need to be able to compensate fairly but you're not measuring people on profitability. You have you yeah. have a much more complicated set of metrics, don't you? Yeah, but there there but there are KPIs that we hold our our employees accountable for. For example, you know, cost of place and loads. Um, you know, on time of placing delivery, loads. right? Um, you know, fa fair market value growth. Of do we get more donors? Um, you know, so this this model here. It, you you got a lot of good KPIs to measure. It, I mean, I got some incredible KPIs that the board holds me accountable for. You know, first one is not changing assets. You know, and that's kind of unheard of in the nonprofit world. Well, you're singing my song, right? I mean, this this whole idea that that although it's complicated, that there are KPIs, that there are actually uh, metrics and accountability uh, approaches is is absolutely uh, critical. I wanted to end the, the the conversation with, with two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, I received um, information that in 2019, your in-kind do donations were 330 million to 90,000 nonprofits. And last year, according to the website, is this correct? You distributed more than $2.5 billion in product? Yep. How did that happen? I mean, that is just, I mean, it, may, it makes my heart sort of explode with happiness, right? Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, we've grown over, you know, almost 10 X. Um, so a couple things have happened. As I mentioned earlier, the ESG movement where people are more amped to donate. And then Amazon, Amazon just just turned on. 
And then the, the whole COVID situation, people were ordering more thing, more e-commerce, supply chains had hiccups in it. I mean, I, I lived through COVID at UPS and I mean, I was on phones with more CEOs than I could ever shake a stick at because it long, long beach was all clogged up. You know, they couldn't get their product enough. You were getting uh, Christmas stuff and Easter and, you know, it was just, one of those things. So I think with all that movement going on in the last four or five years, we've seen all the growth and we've kept up with it. But boy, I mean, we just this year alone, we got 80. We started out with uh, 58 employees. We were at, at, I mean, I'm sorry, 68 employees. We've already added 21 employees this year. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Long Beach. Um, uh, when I was at Oracle, I I installed all the systems for the Pacific Maritime Association, which play which pays all the longshore uh, workers um, for the for for all the carriers. Um, and I I got a real education in in how that actually works. And I was following very closely what was going on with logistics chains all throughout the United States and the world. It was just a mess. And it's it's amazing that coming out of this, you were able with the help, with the support of Amazon and other uh, suppliers to create this release of energy uh, that that helps uh, so many different people. And I wanted to ask this about this other issue that you raised, the ESG situation. Mm-hmm. So ESG is is uh, about um, environmental, social and governance facets yes. in business. I don't understand. Maybe you can explain to me. I don't understand the opposition to that. I mean, it seems to me that that we all have a stake in a holistic approach that that sort of that rising tide lifting all boats making sure that the environment is is good that that we're not we're not engaging in corrupt practices that's that's the we're, we're not paying off people we're not skewing markets through corruption you know the environment being clean like being able to breathe mm-hmm. air it's mm-hmm. a, what's going on with the ESG why does why does You've benefited from from this. Do you have any insight as to why there are people who see that as being a negative thing? I, I don't. I don't get it. Well, I don't either. The only thing I can think of, Mark, is there. There's talk on a lot of legislative forms, laws going into place, and there's some things that's really hard to measure and you know, hard to hold. An organization accountable for you know we all legislate go, everything right it's, yeah, you all, can't. it's not all about laws right yeah but you know it, you get the right donor they do it for the right reasons and you know they get their employees behind it is backed up by their mission statement and their core values and that's where we come in to say what will help you with your employees your mission state your values or even your board uh uh on your organization well, maybe maybe that's the point. I, you know, I never really thought about it, but maybe it's the, the issue is not ESG, but making ESG involuntary. Yes, yes, yes. You know what I mean? You want to do it. You know, you you want to take oh. care of communities that you have a DC and that you have excess product. Why not? You know. So I think the more that organizations want to, from their heart, soul, and head that all that other noise goes away. Yeah, and I think that it also uh, makes for a healthy business environment. Mm-hmm. So Ford basically making a car that its employees could afford to buy. Hershey's, the whole Hershey experiment of making sure that people had good living conditions around the the the, the, the Hershey factory, chocolate, factory. and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. Right, We have a very strong um, uh, set of experiences in this country of, of when we can we actually take care of everybody involved in the chain of value delivery, as opposed to uh, being selfish and 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 not worrying about people. Where we get labor unrest and strikes and right. social disruption and so on. I I think the other thing, Mark, that you're seeing is your millennials and Gen Z is really pushing for organizations to be better, better organizations. What I mean by that. Do they do they give good pay and benefits? Do they recognize the community that they're serving? Obviously, are they good to the environment? Uh, but there's so much behind being a very good corporate company with, and I think the employees are have a louder, stronger voice than they have had. 
what a great advocate you are for that relationship. And one of the ways that people can can contribute to good is giving to Good360, Romaine Seguin, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Good Good360. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's I been mean, a it's, pleasure. I love it's, hearing your insight on the supply chain, too. Thank you so much. <laughs> You can you can fit my entire insight into a thimble. I I need to thank you. This has just been a great interaction, and thanks for sharing all the wisdom that you've accumulated, or at least a tiny bit of it you've accumulated over the years with with our viewers and with uh, with members of the nonprofit community. Thank. Please thank your 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 staff, your board, I your will. Donors, Absolutely. your corporate partners. This is just wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate the time.